Hi, everyone. This is the state of the service mesh panel. My name is Lin Sang. I'm the director of open source with solo.io. I am super excited to moderate the panel for you. Uh, we have an excellent line of panelists. Uh, Edith, can you introduce yourself? For sure. Uh, so my name is Edith Levine, and I'm the founder and CEO of Solo. Uh, at Solo, we are trying to make uh, service mesh easier to adopt and operate, uh, focusing mainly on STO right now. Nick? So I'm Nick Jackson. I work as a developer advocate at HashiCorp, and I'm also writing a book on service mesh patterns with O'Reilly. Marco? Hi, everybody. My name is Marco. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kong. Kong is the creator of Kong Mesh and one of the maintainers for Huma. Louis? Uh, hi, I'm Louis Ryan. Uh, I work at Google uh, and I spend a lot of time working on Istio and, and Google's Istio related products. Uh, William? Hi, I'm William Morgan, CEO of Buoyant. I'm also one of the creators of Linkerd. Excellent. A lot of service mesh knowledge here. So I would like to ask our panelists, how should a user decide if they need service mesh? I start. Go ahead, uh, Edith. Yeah, so like everything in life, this is a trade-off, right? I mean, there is a lot of advantage that service mesh is bringing you to the table. Specifically, I think all of the service mesh is focusing on observability, security as well as routing, uh, traffic and policy. Um, so that's bringing a lot of benefit though, if what you have is one application with two microservices, maybe it's an overkill. But I think the trade-off is where people need to play. Um, and if, so, you know, it's the, the volume of microservices that you have and amount of application that you have, team that working with that versus the, you know, the complexity of operating one. Marco, anything to add? Yeah, I guess perhaps uh, another way to frame this question would be to ask ourselves, when should our application team stop building and reinventing the wheel when it comes to service connectivity? Every time they create a new service or every time they create a new application. Service mesh is always being positioned as yet another thing that we have to do and build and implement and deploy but perhaps it is an opportunity for us to stop doing the hundreds of things that the application teams are doing every time when they want to make a request over the network or receive a request over the network. The things that service mesh solves are not things that we don't need without a service mesh. We still need them, the security, the observability. The difference is how do we implement it? And service mesh allows us to do it from the infrastructure, therefore freeing a uh, very precious time from the application teams. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll okay. just chime in and say from, you know, we help a lot of organizations adopt Linkerd and typically, you know, the, there's the value prop of the service mesh and then there's the, are you set up for this? And the are you set up for this component is, you know, are you already operating basically in kind of a cloud native way? Like, do you have a platform team that owns the underlying platform that can take on the service mesh as part of their responsibility? If you're not, if you don't have that, then like, you know, the all the technology in the world is not going to help you. Are you operating in a world where the developers, you know, are able to own their services, you know, and build on top of the platform without having to understand every detail of the platform? If you don't have that, then like the technology is not going to help you. So there are some organizational prerequisites, which is what we typically look for first before even having the conversation, like, you know, are we going to improve your observability, you know, or, or not? Yeah, these are really insights. Uh, Nick or Noe? I mean, uh, I, I much agree with Marco. Uh, I think it's a trade-off between platform, running a platform and, and actually having to write code. Um, but I, I do think that the the problem of writing the code isn't necessarily going to go away, but the, the, the problem around managing the platform will get easier as time, time goes on and, and sort of the various vendors come to the market which provide you with a managed service mesh. Louis, anything to add? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, uh, you know, talking about platform and platform management, I think William and Nick and Marco covered that pretty well. There's, there's also the top-down constraint, right? If you're in a regulated industry, 
right? And and you have to do zero trust networking like things. You know, your options are moderately limited, right? Um, and they, they range from the open source to the eye-wateringly expensive commercial solution. Um, so yeah, I mean, those those are the things that often drive these decisions outside the, the kind of core, like, are you ready to engage with the value prop of mesh? Is it meaningful to you yet? Or do you need to kind of get to a, a different level of maturity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question, you know, I would like to know the answer to you from your perspective. Is service mesh actually getting easier for enterprise to adopt? Um, William, do you want to start off that one? It's getting easier, uh, I guess. You know, it's it, it's not getting harder. Uh, I think, you know, for enterprises especially, there's like, you know, kind of a, a new swath of vendors, and so like some of the landscape becomes more complicated. And now your your feature matrix, you know, has like a hundred rows in it, whereas last year it might have had fifty rows. So I think in some ways it gets a lot. It's getting more complicated. Um, but, uh, you know, the tooling is being built up. So, um, yeah, I think it's a little bit of a mix, honestly. Yeah. Nick, anything to share? No, I'm, I pretty much would echo what William just said. Yeah, cool. Edith? Yeah, so I think that it's definitely getting easier, but I think we're just scarfing the, the surface of how can we make it even easier. And I think right now, starting to get to the point that service mesh is becoming getting to a maturity that is actually can can be adopted easier let's say but as i said i think that there is way more stuff that we can do in order to make it you know build the tools easier the user experience easier and you know uh, fit it better to the organization who's going to run it and, and etc so i think that as i said it is getting easier it's still hard so hopefully <laughs> we will work on it as a community to make it simpler yeah, uh, Marco, anything to add? Yeah, no, I'm a big believer of simplicity. I think simplicity is a feature. Um, good documentation is a feature. Um, and, you know, easier to adopt. Is it easier for the platform teams to deploy it to the application teams? It, it's, is it easier for the application teams to write their software knowing that there is a service mesh? So I think that there is two angles to this question. And service mesh, it's certainly getting easier to use, easier to deploy. I guess that perhaps the industry can do better to educate the application teams on how to operate with the assumption that there is a service mesh running in the underlying infrastructure. Louis, anything you want to add? So, I, you know, I think, that, you know, the, the service mesh products that are out there, you know, have gotten collectively better at kind of day zero and day one, right? So what, what you see now in enterprise is, you know, that, that day two operation stuff really starting to dominate conversations, at least certainly the ones that I have. Um, you know, if you ship four releases a year and the, the, the company has, you know, the manpower to absorb one update a year, um, you know, how are they supposed to engage with the product? You know, what are their costs to perform upgrade? You get lots of, like, you're seeing growth in the number of managed service mesh offerings, right? Not just installed offerings in response to that, I think. Um, so that, you know, the conversation has shifted um, as, you know, the early adopters are now into a little bit later in their maturity cycle and are dealing with those day two issues. And those are becoming known to you know the the buying side of the market, and so they're asking the same questions in RFCs and things like that. RFPs. Um, so I think that's you know there's still plenty of room for growth. I think to make it easier for enterprises to adopt and maintain, right? because they're not they won't be willing to engage if they don't feel like they can maintain long term. Yeah, totally. But it's exciting, you know. We're making at least getting them on board easier. Um, what is the current state of service mesh? Uh, Nick, anything you want to share? I think it's really good. I mean, I think the, so Louis um, and Marco touched on this, which is around knowledge. So the, the fact that the practitioner can now more easily find information on how do I do X with product Y, that makes a massive advancement in in successful use of the tool and the adoption of the tool. 
And I think as time goes forward and more and more people are creating tutorials and videos and blog posts and things like that, then that kind of community contribution of knowledge really, really helps adoption of, of service mesh. I think it can always get better and I think it will, but I think right now it's, you know, it's, it's really good. It's, it's definitely not something that you question whether it's a production ready technology anymore. That's awesome. Uh, Marco, anything to add? I agree with Nick. Uh, I think service mesh is one of those things that five years from now, looking back, will feel inevitable. I mean, we are distributing our applications. We are decoupling them so we can deploy them faster, you know, in a high available way. And the more services we create, the more applications we create, the more connections we create among all of these moving parts. And it is impossible to think that any organization can be successful with this transformation without having something in place at the infrastructural level that takes care of all of these connections so that we don't have to worry about them anymore. And, uh, and without a service mesh, I really cannot see how that could be possibly successful. And lots of enterprise organizations right now and practitioners are seeing that. And so as the adoption of service mesh increases, which is increasing, service mesh products will get more mature and we're gonna hear more and more success stories from them on how they enabled these transformations with service mesh. So it's a uh, very interesting, very interesting times ahead of, ahead of us. Yeah, Edith, anything to add? Yeah, so I think that uh, when we're looking about the current state, I think that I think that if you're looking at the roadmap, it's most of those measures. Basically, today everybody's talking about make it boring, right? I mean, it's done, the features are there, and now it's relatively boring. So I think this is a very interesting time because that show a huge maturity in the market and definitely there is a market fit, right? I mean, that's why we have this conference. This is why we are here talking about it. Obviously, Service Mesh has a market fit. I think that the interesting thing that will come after it, which I'm personally extremely excited about it is how we can even put push the boundary. Okay, so now we have this great platform that we all agree that should be there. And I think everybody will agree in the organization, as Marco said, in like a fibers thing, it's just going to become part of this platform. I think that what's interesting is what can you do with this right now? You have a platform, how can you extend it? How can you make it more interesting and customized to your own use case? Um, so I think that will be right now probably what we as an ecosystem, all of us, is going to do, right? Try to push the boundaries, and which is pretty exciting. So, Yeah, totally. Uh, Louis or William? Um, so I think there's a couple of things, you know, along with the boring that we it had just referred to, it is also kind of the platformization, right? Um, that service meshes will become a little bit less about the features that they ship and more about how easy it is to enable that last mile of integration that, you know, customers need. Um, you know, that, that's a transformation that takes time as it will take as long as it took to build service meshes, I think, actually. Um, so that's one trend. The other trend I think that we see is the platforms on which people are deploying service meshes are starting to now incorporate service mesh features into those platforms themselves, right? So there's the, there's the bottom-up market validation, right? Um, you know, you see some of that even in Kubernetes, right? Where Kubernetes has like multi-cluster services now, right? There's the, that value proposition is starting to kind of sink down into the infrastructure, which just makes it even more boring, which in my opinion is just good. Yeah, totally. William, you... Yeah, I mean, I can only really speak to the Linkerd perspective, but, you know, Linkerd was like the first service mesh and the one that introduced the term into the lexicons. And we've been asked this question every year since like 2016 or whatever, like the ancient days. Um, for me, like... I don't know. I think uh, the Linkerd is in a <laughs> is in a particularly uh, kind of exciting state. You know, even at this conference, we have uh, you know end users talking about using Linkerd for scheduling COVID nineteen tests for their students. You know, or for doing rapid experimentation at these big financial institutions, or for doing chaos engineering, or for adding FIPS one hundred and forty compliance. And like, it's just it's stuff that I never imagined Linkerd would be used for. And so that, you know, feels awesome. You know, we're up for CNCF graduation. There's like a whole bunch of cool stuff going on. But the thing that we keep coming back to, I think maybe to Louis's point is that ultimately 
you know, service mesh is going to kind of be absorbed. You know, maybe this is what become boring means. It's going to just be, you know, part of the ecosystem, whether we, we call it a, a special name or not. And so the things that are exciting, you know, especially as we think towards the future are what can we build on top of this? Because we know that building a big cloud native application, you know, subject to all the demands that we place on software today is a hard thing to do. And service mesh can solve one, you know, critical part of that. There's a lot more that has to be done. So to me, that's the, that's the kind of most exciting bit is, uh, you know, where do we go from here? Where are we building on top of the service mesh? Yeah, excellent. I think this actually meets uh, nicely to our next question. What's next for your service mesh project? Uh, William, you want to start that off? Uh, we're just shutting it down. Like we're done. No more service mesh. Now, what's next for us? Actually, it is going to sound pretty boring because, you know, the kind of concrete roadmap for Linkerd is largely around policy features. So over the next couple of releases, um, you know, well, I should say the releases leading up to the most recent one, 2.10, have been heavily focused on um, MTLS and getting identity, you know, wired all the way through. Um, and then that's all that has been in service of setting us up to do policy um, and, and tackle some of the like difficult challenges that, that we know that people have, especially in multi-tenant environments. Um, so that is kind of like the concrete answer, I think. More generally, what's next for Linkerd is uh, we want to make it. We have a sense as a project that you know it has to be this platform on top of which people build things. So we recently introduced this um, idea of extensions, which are very very easy ways of plugging into Linkerd. We've already you know got some interesting extensions built on top of that. And to me, I think that solves kind of Linkerd's core uh, vision here, which is we want the service mesh itself to be really small and tightly contained, but we want people to build on top of it and you know, have kind of a modular approach. So that's what's on the roadmap for, uh, for Linkerd. I'm really excited to see how that evolves over the next uh, six months or so. That's great. Uh, Marco, do you want to tell us about Kuma? Yeah. Uh, so Kuma comes out of the uh, work and the efforts that Kong is doing with uh, our enterprise customers. So it's the fruit of that work. And you know, service mesh, it is an important piece of the broader connectivity puzzle of how enterprise architects are going to be providing connectivity to their application teams. And when we built Kuma, we started with that uh, starting point. So we're going to be having teams that are far away in their Kubernetes journey. We're going to be having teams that are not on Kubernetes yet. So how can we provide a connectivity layer that creates an, an overlay, an abstraction across not only Kubernetes, but anything, including virtual machines that the organization may be running. And we are, obviously that's a very complicated problem, being able to run a service mesh in a multi-zone capacity, upgrading it, making sure that we always know if something goes wrong, where it goes wrong. So the oper operations of running a multi-zone service mesh across Kubernetes and VMs, across multiple clouds, um, you know, the easy upgrade button that allows us to upgrade the service mesh and the data plane proxies. That's certainly something that I'm very excited about. Um, as well, we've been doing lots of work when it comes to uh, putting the, you know, building a foundation for our adaptive routing features that would allow us to uh, improve the high availability of our applications without necessarily having to have human intervention every time. And the more services, the more applications, the more connections, and obviously the harder it's going to be to be on top of all of this. And so the infrastructure at the end of the day, service mesh even, it's a mean to an end. And that end is reliability, security. Um, and so we are working towards automating all of that so we can remove the human factor out of the equation. Yeah, Nick, um, what about you? I saw you nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so predominantly, I suppose, operational aspects, making it easier to operate is is one of the key things. We're, we're going to continue to, um, with HashiCorp uh, Cloud, into different sort of clouds. So you'll you'll have managed console in, um, in, in across more of the cloud vendors in the coming coming year. The, the kind of the operational aspect of configuring multi-cluster capabilities or for connecting sort of a Kubernetes workload of virtual machine, the, the, the operational elements of that is going to be simpler, easier to kind of to manage the, the sort of security and, and the actual elements of configuration. Um, and predominantly it's around the sort of the Kubernetes story as well and, and delivering a really great um, experience to a Kubernetes practitioner. So you know, treating things like the, the sort of 
it should feel native that you're you're just using an extension of Kubernetes and not a, a sort of a different product. Those those are some of the sort of the goals that we we're trying to. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Uh, Louis, anything you want to share from like is your perspective? Well, I, I guess I'll share two perspectives, right? So with my Istio hat on, like a, a lot of what Nick just said, plus the day two operation stuff around upgrades, maintenance, just lifecycle management. Istio has lots of features. Um, and so most of our, our feature roadmap is kind of just incremental customer driven stuff, um, you know, probably with a focus on compliance and security things. Um, and with my Google hat on, right, it's, it's you know, enabling how Google's customers to, you know, yeah, e easily adopt and absorb service mesh. You know, we recently launched a, a fully managed uh, Istio-based solution for customers. So they, they don't manage the control plane aspects of Istio anymore. We do that for them. Um, and, and yeah, that's aligned with the goals around day two operations as well, right? Just to try and lighten the load for people as much as we can. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's aligned with the trend like Nick just talked about, right? HashiCorp is going to provide, I guess, managed console connector, similar things. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so that's... yeah, eat it. Anything you want to share from Istio, Glue Mesh? Of course. Yeah, so I mean, we, I'm a little bit different because each of the people who's talking here is basically very associated to one project. And you meet Solo, we are working mainly with Estio today. But we started our, our journey a little bit different. We started basically with Envoy. That was the thing that we based on. And therefore, the first thing that we built was API Gateway. The second thing, and basically we built the building platform, right? The building blocks to create those this platform. So... Basically, what, what we, we have is basically, hey, is an API gateway that built on top of Envoy, sec and now is going to shift on top of STO. The second thing that we have is Glue Mesh, is basically helping to manage and basically focus on the day two operation, as well as very big focus on multi-cluster and basically managing a lot of instances of STO, um, and, you know, fall over between them and so on. Then the Third thing that we were focusing about is extending the mesh with WebAssembly. So this is something that we worked very, very hard and brought WebAssembly Hub to the community and to our product. And the last one was developer portal, which is basically, you know, the next, in my opinion, you know, you know, uh, make sense approach to basically manage all of this, kind of like bring it to the developer, be able to, to expose all the API that's running. So this is the building block that we have. And I think that now when we have this platform, right, that it's all kind of like working specifically on STO and Envoy, and we have the knowledge of doing SVO and Envoy, again, we are pushing the boundaries. So the next thing that we're going to do is working on building on top of it. And we're going to have some very crazy and awesome announcement very soon. So yeah, stay tuned. That's excellent. These are all the questions I have. I would love to hear the questions from the audience. 